Hello, uh, my name is Yassi uh, Chimo, and today I will be talking a little bit about um, something that I'm quite passionate in, and it's education. So I'm actually quite glad there's a lot of you here today who care about education. So what I'm going to talk to you a bit today is about how we need the younger generation uh, with unicentered learning models and designers. Now I made that up, user centered learning. So uh, if you Google it, I don't know. Now, um, something that I want to do um, is start, and let's talk about technology edu and education. So how do schools teach computer education? So the class of uh, yesterday, so this is, I'm sorry for the colors, the, 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 the class of yesterday, which is my year, sat in front of rows and rows of computers. Now, the things that I would talk about, that I was taught at school was how to use Excel, how to use PowerPoint, and how to use Microsoft Access. Now, I don't know if Microsoft Access is here today, but the other ones still are. Now, the reason why it's interesting is because I was born into the era of technology, so they were teaching me things that we picked up in seconds. And as evolution of the, the interfaces went with Microsoft Word, we didn't you don't really need to know how to use something, you just pick it up and use it. So how does that compare to the, the class of today? Well, the class of today is much, uh, you know, it's a bit more different, a bit diverse. So now it's a bit more mobile, and they, they're using computers to be more creative. So you don't come to school and you don't, you're not taught how to use software, it's a bit more creative. And even in impoverished areas, so areas of Asia and Africa, they still have access to computers and they still have access to digital learning. And that's quite important. So what does the class of tomorrow look like? Well, we know that it's very much uh, more mobile. We know that it's more interactive. And because of touch devices, it's more tangible. Now, is Tablets, or are tablets and iPads really going to revolutionize education? Well, they already are. Um, are they going to replace textbooks? I think that's the big question. Well, I think um, we'll get into a, a some place in between where you'll still have your textbooks. But what the tablet will do is obviously um, revolutionize the experience after the textbook. Now, something we all know about ourselves, and when we're little, and when um, we're babies, is that we're born curious. So we are born into the world and it's all about proprioception. So you're trying to understand the world around you. So you're interacting and you're playing and you're trying to find out and learn. And as you, as uh, our children grow up, they're masters of the magical touch. So they know how to use something. Something is really intuitive to them. So they don't need to be taught how to use something. And what's really interesting is this tablet era is the new normal. So these are kids' toys now, um, and it's all around tablet devices and computer devices. And for children now, it's actually really interesting because when we were born, our language that we speak is our native language, our mother tongue. But children today, they're digital natives, so they have a very different skill set when they grow up. They're more digital, we all know. And this is very interesting because as of two months ago in England, um, they introduced, they completely changed the curriculum for five-year-old education, and they introduced coding. I'm not going to use the word coding, actually. They, they're starting to teach algorithms um, to kids of five years old, and they took them out of the classroom, and they basically give them the lessons of uh, the foundations of coding. Now, England is you know, one of the major countries that's doing that as of two months ago. Um, and where they want to be is like Israel, who have digital education core and center inside their curriculum. And when these kids grow up and are uh, 14 years old, then they'll start to learn coding languages. So you embed them a little bit early around the principles, and then we take them further. Now, coding is actually quite interesting. And I, had, I managed to... Um, speak with Tim Berners-Lee, so the father of the internet, and uh, he said one thing a few months ago um, that I was like, yeah, I'm going to use this. So he said, code more, code young, to enable future lawyers and politicians 
to be able to support and understand the internet. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? If you're a politician or if you're a lawyer, you want to know digital so that you can protect it. So that's really interesting. However, my talk is not about coding. So digital education isn't just about code. Coding is certainly one aspect of it. So the question is, what is the other side of uh, digital education? And this is where I'm going to ask you the question. Um, so I'm going to pose you one question, and I want you to uh, think about it for a few minutes. What is your biggest learning from working in digital that you would go back and tell your teenage self, right? So what have you learned being practitioners of digital that you would go back and tell your teenage self? So I just want you to think about that, and then we'll get back to that. So what I did, rather than saying what digital education should be like, is I asked, you know, people, uh, so my friends, my colleagues, and people in the digital world back in London and in America, and I've compiled a few answers together, so, um, so we'll see what they say. The contrast is a bit off, so I'll, I'll read that. So this is Nikki, she's in the UN, uh, and she's in America. So she said, make it your mission to speak uh, to someone face to face, over the phone, etc." We have another one saying, learn to be comfortable with uncertainty and taking risks. You will not always succeed, but you will always learn something from the experience. That's what she would tell her, uh, her teenage self. Lucy from London, you will never fail at something. Believing that you could get something right the first time is stupid. Uh, not getting something right isn't a failure. It's the way you learn. Try lots of things before you get it right. Uh, this is Mel, a product owner. And she said, find a mentor, be an apprentice, learn by doing. Uh, another one, Alberta, you can't know everything, and that's okay. Uh, Jane, who's the head of UX at the Telegraph, she said, people are just as shy as you are. If you ask them loads of questions about themselves, they'll relax. Think, uh, and think that you are a brilliant uh, conversationalist. We have a few more. Be curious, don't let yourself be lazy. We have Chris, who is talking about love and passion, so follow what you do and follow what you love. A user researcher who I work with, uh, embrace failure and learn from it. Not, always, uh, not to always be seeking perfection in everything, because you'll never get to the destination. We have another one saying, uh, allow yourself to go with your gut instinct sometimes. There will be uh, a time to iterate. In life too. Um, another UX, don't be afraid to ask questions. Most of the time, everyone is wondering the same thing. Um, my favorite one is a designer. Drop <laughs> are not the future. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And um, my one is be a believer in people uh, and always put them first. So that's what I would go back and tell my past self. Now, if we take all of those, you can see some themes groups. So um, I've taken the two creating these groups. So we have interact, do, know, and understand. So interact is all about the interactions, all about the people, it's all about speaking face to face. The doing is the risk taking, it's the failure, it's the do uh, learn by doing. <laughs> Knowing is knowledge, so it's understanding knowledge first. Um, and then we have understanding. And this is functional. So what, uh, how does something work? So if we take, so actually, what I want you to do is uh, think about which one that, that you would tell your child self where that would sit. Um, and I'll just give you a quick raise of hands. If it was interact to do with people to people, raise your hand. Okay. If it's do, interesting. If it's no, Right. And it's understand. Okay. So it's probably to no surprise then that uh, if we correlate with the people that I just said, we have five for interact, seven for do, two for know, and two for understand. So doing is actually quite important, as you all said it as well. And you know, I'm not. This is not revolutionary. Um, I'm just saying something that we've all heard before, and you've probably read it in about ten different textbooks and a hundred different articles that fail fast and fail often. And this is something you know, that permeated from Silicon Valley and then that we're trying to do as digital practitioners 
down to what we're trying to do today. Um, and I have uh, a quote from Richard Branson. Uh, ever try, never fail, no matter, try again, fail again, and fail better. Now, actually, he copied that quote. So, you know, he copied it from Samuel Beckett. So, but he said, you know, I can put it. Um, so, what about failure in the classroom now? Um, and I think this is the really interesting thing, because that's where it all starts, when we're younger. And there is a, an awesome psychologist, and you should really look her up. Her name is Carol Dweck. Her name will come up. And what she said is, happiness is being infinitely curious, consistently learning, consistently mastering new and difficult tasks. Now she, yeah, so she spent most of her research understanding failure in the classroom among children. So what she says is that for children, we have two different mindsets. She, she looked about seven years old, but then she, her research then expanded this, so it even applies to us today. So we have two different mindsets. We have the fixed mindset and we have the growth mindset. So fixed intelligence is basically knowing what you can do, and that's it. It's like fixed, and that's it. You know that you can get X and mark, and that's it. That's your fixed intelligence. Whereas the growth intelligence, you might not be as clever as the fixed one, but you know you can learn, and you can always progress further. Now, where this is really interesting is when we look at errors and mistakes, and this is her research. And she said, when looking at errors and mistakes between seven-year-olds, between the uh, fixed mindset and the growth mindset, it was really interesting. Because with the fixed mindset, they were not engaged, they weren't curious, and they fled from mistakes. So once they caught a mistake, they ran away from it, because they didn't want to face uh, face up to the mistake. Whereas the growth mindset, were more engaged, were more curious, and did not really interesting. So how do kids really get these two different mindsets? Well, it starts with praise. The praise in the classroom and praise at home. We're going to look in the classroom. And there are two different types of praises. We have the ability praise, and we have the process praise. And the ability praise is basically, as it suggests, Really saying something about your ability. Wow, you're really clever. Whereas the process phrase is actually rewarding someone for the process that they came to that answer. So then they looked at, well, can can we swap it around? Can we uh, can we go from a growth to a fixed? And the answer is yes. And what she did was is say to the fixed mind children, that your brain is like a muscle, right? And if you go to the gym, your muscles get bigger. So, the more you learn, the more you push yourself. It's going to hurt, but there are connections in your brain you're forming, and then that will make you better. And it was true. She recorded significant growth in, uh, in being able to convert fit to growth mindset. So, she then sums it up in saying, happy life equals happy schools. And do have a look at her work, because then she, she took this principle and went to the Middle East. But that's a, that's a whole other conversation. Now, I, this was interesting. So then I went to go and speak to uh, a high school educator. And he said, teachers make it so students don't fail. And it was really interesting, because in the education system today, it's very different than it was back in the day. Well, back in the day, the child was responsible for his failure. Now it's very much the teacher is responsible for the child's failure. So what happens? The teacher don't let them fail. And that's not to say that they don't pass them, it's just that they don't let the children experience failure. So I'm just gonna go back to the fixed and growth mindset. And we're just going to I'm just going to extrapolate that, and I'm going to call it a fixed process. And is there anything that we do in our day-to-day -day lives in uh, at work 
that applies to a fixed process. So a fixed process, we said, or for a fixed mindset, but a fixed process, is something that you know you can achieve, but doesn't grow. And something that um, we can look at is the waterfall method right. of uh, development. It's very fixed. There's no room for growth. Whereas, obviously, you can see where I'm going with it. Whereas the growth process, which is all about evolving, adapting, is more agile. So, what's interesting is when we go back to our do, is what you guys said and what these guys said, is actually what they were saying is, really, I would go back to my childhood self and try and make them have a growth mindset. Because that's what it is. It's about failing and it's about growing. So now we need to look at education and how we teach it at school. And at the moment, digital education is focusing on the how. How to do something, how does something work, how to code, rather than the why. Why am I coding? Why am I doing this? What am I going to do with it? So, think of, let's think of a scenario now. Wouldn't it be great if we took some students, some kids, we got them to think about something. So in this task, we we're, thinking, we're getting them to think about how to make a, a laptop. And then we're going to say, well, now we're going to build this laptop. So Lego bricks. And we're going to test it out. Oh, wait a minute. Oops, it didn't actually work. Failed. But then we can learn and improve, because obviously the materials weren't right. Things weren't right. We can learn and improve and get better. So, how do we then reach out to children and apply this user-centered learning and make sure they understand the process? And what can we learn in the process? So I'm going to take you through two examples now. Um, one of them was my time at Apple, and the other one is my time at good. Now, Apple is awesome, right? Um, so they are creators of music experience and all the rest of it. Now, what is really, really awesome is that when school finishes for the summer, Apple do something that's actually quite clever. They call it summer camp. Um, and what they do is they invite students in, so you have to apply, you get your parents to apply. And it's a two-week program. And what they do is they obviously take you through some different processes. And there is another, there is another type, there's, there's a, a summer camp is one of them. And the other one is field trips. So your school, uh, your teachers can arrange a field trip to go to the Apple store, maybe not in Argentina just yet, but they will teach you and they will go through certain things. And it's about those certain things that I will take you through. So what is this summer camp and what do they do? Well, the first thing is that they get experts out and expose them. So these are people who are in the craft and they are masters of their skill. Now, we all know that Apple um, is all about thinking differently. And that's exactly what they want to do with this scheme. They want kids to think a bit differently. So their intent with this is to let kids explore, to let kids interact. And actually, it's not about the devices. The devices come second. So what we did was, um, when, student, uh, when, yeah, when students used to come in, there used to be a theme that they would, they would run each year. So the theme that I was involved in is called um, Work with iMovie. Um, and what we had to do was basically get these children to think about the story, to tell a story, but not actually write it down and not draw it, but to think why they want to tell the story. It's actually pretty impressive that Apple are trying to get kids to think like this. And the purpose is for kids to create, learn, and present. So it's to, it's to really come out of their comfort zone. Because it's that coming out of their comfort zone that really makes you a growth mindset. So this is um, the field trip. Um, where as you can see, these are the yellow and the other ones are blue. The same principle applies. They get a group of students in. And we'll talk about what they do now. So they want, so Apple wants to bring student stories to life. 
and they let kids run around with all these devices and let them do whatever they want with it. So they don't force them through a rigid process. They are like, you know, they start off with the experts and then they go off and be creative. And this is the interesting bit because then they start to take it into their own hands. They start to form a story. They start to form different narratives. And this is what's the interesting bit. Because then, students then ask themselves, how do I tell this story? Because it's not about this anymore. It's about this. How am I going to present that? Now, you're probably wondering, why does Apple care? And I don't know. But all I do know is that they change every year. So they take their learnings from their Apple account, which is location, uh, which localized, so different learnings, depending on culture, and they improve it for the next year, the next year, the next year. You could argue that this exposure to kids at such a young age is brilliant for, for Apple because you're interacting with their devices. So come Christmas time, what device is the kid going to be asking for? But really, it's, a, it's actually about trying to get them to think differently. The second experience, uh, the second experience I'm going to take you through is Apps for Good. And this is one that I've done for a couple of years now. And Apps for Good is actually a pretty amazing company. It's a charity. And what they do is, they basically said to themselves one day, education, digital education in the UK sucks. So, how can we make it better? How can we get students to think about the things that we do every day, the full development cycle. So, the first thing that they, they did was, well, we're a charity, we don't pay, so then we can't uh, get experts in by paying. So they have volunteers. So these are people, there's um, about 5,000 uh, 5, people who are registered in the UK now, and they're masters of their craft. So I give some lessons, other people give different lessons. And it's about taking an hour, not even a week, an hour a month, which is probably nothing. And how the sessions are delivered in remotely. You can either come, you can either go to the school, or you can do it by Skype. And Skype being the biggest challenge of all, because how do you tell kids, how do you take kids through this journey that they've never been before through a glass screen. And that's something that we still haven't cracked yet. And what we do, what the intent of Apps for Good is to take kids through the full development cycle. Okay? So the curriculum is, it's actually not a curriculum, it's extracurricular. And schools can register and kids have to devote an hour to two hours a week to doing this. And the format is kids uh, arrange into groups, and then they go through the whole process. So ideas reading, uh, then we go into a bit more about user research, and then we involve other disciplines, market research, and then they learn about the differences between the two, and then so on and so forth. And they ta they're, ta they're tasked with developing and crafting their app ideas. So it's all around apps. And what's really good is it's incentivized at the end because you have <coughs> Great companies like Microsoft, and Samsung, and Sony, and Barclays Bank try, uh, sponsoring this, so they they bring the uh, the apps to life at the end. So, what happens throughout this uh, this process? Well, the key thing is they are always asking the why. They're always they're always asked to think of the why, and I think that's key. Is always asking the why. My question is how, because this is me, ironically wearing the same shirt, <laughs> but kids have a 10 second attention span, and when I, when I get back to the learnings that I did from this course, this is the biggest, this is the biggest thing. How do you, tell, how do you tell, take someone through the whole process that we do, that takes months and months and months, in a, in a number of days, even weeks. So the secret to it is about scenarios. And 
in this example, and I'll take you through. So I'm, I'll take you through an, uh, an example that I used. So I had a, uh, a room, probably uh, about the same number here, and then I said to them, "My friends at school think they can make cookies like this, which is all nice, but they turn out like this. My cookies turn out like that." The intent by doing this, by framing it in this way, is that the kids do not see, or well, the kids pretty much see presentations like this. I want them to take. I want to take them through a story, and you'll see why the story is important. Secretly, I am trying to find out and convey who's it for. So we do have some exercises and some templates that they do. And going back to my scenario. I say, let's meet Anna. She um, she goes to the she's ten. She goes to school, and she has a few bits about her, right? I'm not using any scary words, and I'm relating to the children. And then they're asked with to, uh, to answer some few a few questions: Who is it? Where they will use it? Uh, why they will use it? And a few questions about them. So I think you know where I'm going with this. We're building personas. And this is pretty amazing because we had a, a, a whole class of kids and they were engaged. And this group's idea, which I especially like, because it was very different, they, they created an app to help um, kids who have difficulty coming out and need help and support and guidance. For kids to think about something so serious, it's pretty good. And they were coming out, they were coming up with personas and they were really engaged in the task. And then the big question is, what can it do? And this is a big question that we we know, and I'm not going to use the three, I will use it, but the three letter word that we, uh, that we will use, MVP. But really, what can it do? So in our scenario about the cookies, what I took them through, and I'm not going to bore you with all the slides, is that my little cookie app could capture, communicate, interact, it uh, has reading elements, playing elements, and sharing. There's a lot in one app, right? And this is the magical slide. And if I was to ever pull a slide, it always works. Which would you rather play? The 101 games in one, or Angry Birds? And I think you know what they all said. The interesting thing here is they were exposed to a very different mindset. They were, they were asked to think differently. And then what followed was actually something pretty amazing. Because they fought with each other, not physically. But then they were asked to really think about what does their app, think of one thing that their app does, or that they want their app to do, right? It's all about this MVP business. But just this one core thing, what does this one thing do? I told them. And so then there was a lot of debate around that amongst the groups. So I wanted them to focus on one thing and do it really well. And again, we're using these traditional methods that we use every day, prioritary, uh, prioritization dots, so that people could rate different things, which is pretty amazing. And then what happened was, step by step, this was uh, an evolutionary process, that kids were building up on things, and they were fully engaged. I cannot stress that enough. So then my, uh, my big takeaways from this uh, experience that I gave to them is what makes a good experience is kind of like summing up what UX is, useful, usable, and desirable, and getting them to think about that. And this is the interesting bit. So when they went through the whole process of, yeah, I want GPS, I want uh, Bluetooth, and I want uh, QR codes, and I want augmented reality, and then in my in my example, my cooking my cookie example, is this is my persona at work. And then they were like, oh crap, she's not really using her phone because her hand are covered in flour, right? And I think that's key because then they were asked to think about how it's going to be used. And that was really that was really amazing. They stripped back all their features and they found that one feature that they really, really wanted. So then what happened afterwards? Well, it, they were made, not all of them. So the, the actual program in the UK is that they, um, 
different schools have different ideas, and it goes to a panel, and the panel um, decides then who gets to progress. And it's, it's, it's a difficult one because the, the, a group can do wireframes, they can do sketches, they can go the full mile. But if the core idea is flawed, then it's really hard to tell them. And we'll get back to that failure. So then these kids have their ideas created. So they have to present, and they have their prototypes here, and they have people coming in from the industry, and they're really engaged with them. Here's one talking about a, uh, a bank. And what's really interesting is seeing these kids being passionate about digital, about things that they love, engaging in different ways, trying to take people through their scenarios. And one person had a butcher hat, which is one to include that. <laughs> so we kind of failed, which was a success for us. The reason why we failed is because it's hard to teach kids how to fail. We do it part time. So this app for good program is only a small amount of time. It's not embedded into the whole education process. So we can't tell them to fail and expect them to be okay about it. It's something that they need to be engaged all the time. It was a success because they got to see the whole process through end to end. And my um, and. This is how we validated if we uh, if it was successful or not. So every year, uh, I've been running for a few years now. We ask the students what do they learn, and we ask, we, get, we have a series of questions to really find out about whether we're performing well in what areas. And these are the five areas, uh, the top five, that we're performing really well on. So kids are saying that the absolute good program help is helping them come up with ideas, solving problems, working in groups making presentations and judging if ideas are good. And this is pretty amazing because if you saw the other questions which were more functional, then it, you know we really hit the, uh, the nail on the head in, in the doing, helping kids do. So, now we have 15 minutes left. So I have a few takeaways that you can't see. But if you get a child to understand, you can get anyone to understand now, you might not believe me, but I had to do a presentation to the CEO of the Telegraph, and the Telegraph is a big, if you don't know it, it's a big media company like uh, La Nation. Um, and I had to do a big presentation to the CEO. And what the funny thing for me was I used the same principle. The same thing that I did for those kids, I did with stakeholders. And I got them on my side. I won. Because if you can do it if you can get a kid engaged, you can get anyone engaged. That's a secret. <laughs> um, teaching children what we do gives them an additional perspective, right? We are lucky to be in this industry because it's not really mature enough. We're always learning and we're always developing. So if we can pass those learnings down generations, it means that it's always going to be evolving. You uh, you will realize very quickly what to improve and how. I was taking you through the scenario of, uh, when was it? A few months ago. Not a few years ago. Because I then developed my formula, my recipe for success. It's, um, so if you engage, you will start to see how you can be better communicators. So my biggest thing is to try out, get involved, teach and learn. Now, the biggest thing what you can do is form groups. And I, I do recommend that you try it. Just form a group, a few people, go to a school, and then just explain that you just want to, an hour or two hours and take kids through that process. You don't actually have to use real world examples that you do in your day to day life, because they probably aren't for kids anyway. Just go through fictional ones, because then you realize where you can improve in your delivery. And I'm going to end in um, one of the quotes that I have on the office. It's on the big office wall. I took it just before uh, I came out here. It's uh, Thomas and I have not failed. Uh, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And I think that's pretty, that's pretty apt. So um, that's me. Thank you very much.